Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 19th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain what the real mega dividends being distributed from permanent fund earnings are. They are not what, and they are far bigger than most think. Second, we provide our initial reaction to the Dunleavy veto message. It's far from positive. And third, we agree with those who are calling out Republican fiscal hypocrisy at the federal level and explain why now they should start calling out the equal fiscal hypocrisy of Democrats at the state level. And now let's join Michael. Well, let's talk about let's talk about the mega dividend. You said the true mega dividend. What, what are we talking about here? There was a statement that Sarah Hannon, Representative Sarah Hannon from Juno, made during the session that has continued to bug me. It was during the budget debate on the House floor, Hannon had introduced an amendment to, if you'll recall, the, the PFD that came out of House Finance was a POMB 5050 PFD. And Hannon introduced an amendment on the House floor to reduce that to, to P, POMB 2575, to essentially to, to cut the, the portion of the POMB draw going to the PFD in half. And during the debate, uh, she closed out the debate uh, by saying this. She said, free rides die hard. And she meant that as a derogatory statement against those, toward those who had been defending the bigger PFD, the POMB 5050, during the debate. It was sort of the equivalent of Natasha von Imhoff's, you know, screech, screed, that she went off on that you you know help helpfully open the show with every every day, um, but it was it was Hannon's version of you guys just don't understand free you, you guys have been getting a free ride and free rides die hard and I, I get why you're shouting about it but it's time for them to die, and that's bothered me and and the, and the reason it's bothered me is there are two free rides going on in permanent fund earnings, one is the PFD that's distributed the, the portion of permanent fund earnings uh, that are distributed out to Alaska families in the form of the PFD. But there's a second free ride that's that's coming out of permanent fund earnings and it's the free it's free government. It's the free ride to get government without having to pay for it, without having to pay taxes for it. And and that free ride um, is is equally as free uh, in terms of its impact on, on Alaskans, they don't have to pay taxes equally as free uh, as the PFD in terms of, in terms of free money. I, I, I've talked about this in various ways over the course of the shows, but I've never really calculated what the value of that free ride, that second free ride is. Um, and so I, the last couple of weeks in, in my Alaska landmine column, I've spent time going through and looking at what the free ride, what, what the value of that free ride is. And it's amazing. It is just amazing. So what happens is as the PFD shrinks, the amount that's going over to this other free ride, free government, what I call in the landmine columns, the tax avoidance dividend, because you're getting essentially a dividend to avoid taxes. The tax avoidance dividend, as the, as the PFD shrinks, the tax avoidance dividend increases. 
And what I had never done before was calculate um, the, the impact on Alaska families of that tax avoidance dividend. And obviously, as, as incomes go up, the value of the tax avoidance dividend goes up. If you're a, if you're a low 20% family, low, lowest 20% family, you, you're not going to pay much in taxes anyway. So the value of free government, the value of that tax avoidance dividend is relatively low. If you're a middle income Alaska family, it, it, it has some meaning because you otherwise might pay ta some taxes if we had taxes to cover the, the cost of government, if you, we didn't have free money for government. Right. But the value of the tax avoidance dividend of the top 20 percent is huge. Um, and uh, and it grows and it grows inversely to, P, to to the PFD. So as the PFD goes down because more money is going to the tax avoidance dividend, the value of the tax avoidance dividend um, is going up. Rick Halford in a in a in what what sort of also was sitting in the back of my mind. Rick Halford in testimony to House Judiciary um, on one of the constitutional amendments for the PFD a couple of years ago talked about the $100,000 PF, uh, the $100,000 dividend. And what he meant by that was when we repealed the dividend, when the state repealed the dividend, uh, repealed the income tax in the early 1980s, those who otherwise were paying taxes got free government, got, got a, a tax avoidance dividend. And, and Rick talked about the value of that dividend to those who otherwise were paying taxes and, and suddenly didn't have to pay taxes anymore because of the influx of oil earnings as being $100,000. So, so that was sort of buzzing around my mind also. So I did these calculations and, and the, the calculations are on or in last week's uh, Alaska landmine column for those that are interested. But at the, even at the statutory PFD, the, the tax, the value of the tax avoidance dividend, the value of the remaining portion of permanent fund earnings that go to avoid uh, taxes, that go to the free money that goes to government that have yeah, been right. able to avoid taxes. Even at, even at the statutory PFD, the leftover amount that's going to tax avoidance dividend for the, for the top 20% overall is worth about $10,000. For the top 5% is worth about $21,000. And for the top one percent, this is at the statutory PFD. At the at the at the at the top one percent, it's worth fifty four thousand dollars. They're avoiding fifty four thousand dollars in taxes they otherwise would pay as a as a result of using these the permanent fund earnings to give you to give them free government. At POMB fifty fifty, the the PFD is coming down. So the PFD is now the PFD was at ten thousand dollars under a statutory PFD, averaged over the the 24 to 32 time period um, at 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 uh, at, at POMV 5050, the value of the PMV, the value of the PFD is eight thousand dollars per family. For the top 20 percent, it's sixteen thousand. The the tax avoidance dividend, on the other hand, for the top 20 percent, sixteen thousand. For the top five percent, thirty two thousand. For the top one percent, it's eighty thousand dollars. When you go to POMV 2575. The value of the PFD for Alaska families has now fallen significantly. It's down to three thousand dollars, four thousand dollars for the for the average family. But the tax avoidance dividend, the amount of government, the amount of taxes that the top twenty percent are avoiding uh, as a result of shifting over the the permanent fund earnings to cover the cost of government, is worth twenty four thousand dollars to a top twenty percent family, forty eight thousand dollars. To a top five uh, percent uh, 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 family, and a hundred and twenty thousand dollars to a top one percent family. It's a hundred thousand dollars a plus a hundred thousand plus dollar dividend that free government to the to the to the top one percent. And if you go to a leftover PFD, which is you know what Natasha has preached, you know what whatever the PFD is, whatever's left over after we spend for government after we've used the rest of the permanent fund earnings to, to avoid taxes, the tax avoidance dividend to spend for government. If you go to the leftover PFD over the next 10 years, the average value of that to the Alaska family, the average value of the PFD is $1,400. The average value of the top 20% is 28,000 of the tax avoidance dividend is $28,000. The average of the 
uh, to the to the top five percent at the leftover PFD of the tax avoidance dividends fifty seven thousand dollars, and the average value to the top one percent is one hundred and forty four thousand dollars. So when when people talk about the mega PFD, the PFD, I, I mean, or when they talk about mega dividends, the PFD is a piker is 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 infinitesimal compared to the dividends that the top 20%, the tax avoidance dividends, the top 20% are getting out of the diversion of permanent fund earnings over to, to cover the costs of government that they would, uh, that they would otherwise have for, have right. pay for. The, the, the true mega dividend is over in the tax avoidance dividend. The PFD is just, is, is, is just small compared to, especially at the leftover PFD level, it's just small, infinitesimally small compared to the amount of, of benefit that the top 20% is getting. So, I don't, you know, every time from now on that somebody says mega PFD or mega mega dividend, I'm going to haul this chart out and say, yeah, here's where the true mega dividends are. They're going to <laughs> Natasha von Imhoff and to the top 20%. Right. Well, when you look at these numbers again, uh, 100. That means that the top 20% cumulatively is receiving a, a, a mega dividend of over 250000 or $230,000 on this compared to our $1,000 or $1,400 dividend that we're receiving as a family of three, right? I mean, this is, this is based on a 2.81 persons per household. So this is a household receipt of $1,400 versus the big money from everybody else. Yeah, exactly. Th those aren't those aren't additive. So it's the top twenty percent in blue, within the top twenty percent, the top five percent in maroon, and within okay. the top five percent, the top. So so the, the but the top one percent, we they're getting the benefit of permit of using permanent fund earnings to cover their government costs, to cover their share of government costs. These are calculated on a flat tax, by the way. They're 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 getting the benefit of the using the per, diverting the permanent fund earnings to cover their share of government costs to the tune of $144,000 uh, if we're using a leftover PFD, $120,000 if we're using POMB 2575. That's what's really going on. I mean, if you want to know what's really going on with the PFD cuts, what's really going on is we're taking money out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families, 80% of Alaska families. We're increasing the pot of money that's being used to cover taxes, to avoid taxes. And the beneficiaries of uh, the, 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 the top 20 percent, the beneficiaries of that tax avoidance uh, dividend are reaping huge dollars in benefits. The benefit is they don't have to take the money out of their bank account to pay for taxes. Right. The government or the, the, the permanent fund earnings is paying taxes for them. Actually, the bottom 80% are paying taxes for them because we're creating the fund through through PFD cuts and we're paying, we're covering their taxes for them. So they're getting to keep money that they would otherwise have to pay taxes. Money's coming out of the bottom 80%'s pockets. So the top 20% can keep up to $120,000 at POMB 2575, can keep $120,000 in their pockets. It's It's astounding the size of the benefit that's being transferred. So when Sarah Hannon says free rides die hard, the free <laughs> ride the free ride that's really dying hard here is the free ride of the top 20% of the tax avoidance dividend. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. That is a mega dividend, my friend. I don't know how else to put that when you're talking about that kind of avoidance of $100,000 uh, or even half that much. Definitely, uh, kind of shocking to look at that charts an eye opener, man. When you start realizing the avoided costs, um, by these, uh, you know, by these folks, the avoided costs of that, even in the top 50%, it's gotta be in the 10 to $15,000 range. It's, uh, one thing for sure. And I think Kathy kind of nails it here. One thing is definitely for sure that shows the outrageous cost of our government. When you start talking about those kind of numbers, it definitely shows us, the real actual cost of what's going on. I, I agree with that, Michael, but here's the, here's the problem that we face. The top 20% don't have to, don't have to pay for government because we're using permanent fund earnings to, to cover the, their costs of government. They don't care. They don't, they don't care how high government costs go. The other 80% are paying for it through PFD cuts, but the top 20%, 
are getting their costs covered by their share of the cost covered by the by the diversion of the permanent fund earnings. And so they don't care. And and that's that's I know I've said this before and I you know I'll likely say it a hundred times again, but that's the real problem with our fiscal policy. We don't have all Alaska families paying a share of the true cost of government and thus having an incentive to push back on the cost of government. We've allowed the top, we've created a structure in which the top 20%, those, the, the, the donor class, those with the most influence, those that run the, the companies, those that send the lobbyists down, we've allowed the top 20% off the hook in terms of paying the cost of government. Yeah, they're outrageous, but they don't, but they don't see them. They don't have to pay for them. No, they, they don't get mind. to avoid them. Right. They don't mind because, again, not only do they not have to pay for it, it actually helps their donor class because they got a lot of people out there who are crony capitalists who are loving that extra lucre going out there and doing it. It means they get to retain their power, um, which is just shocking. Um, and, and I know you're going to comment on this when the governor comes back on about his absence from the public eye, et cetera, et cetera. But. I, I don't know, Brad. I, you know, this is one of those days where I feel a little, I feel a little frustrated. I feel a little frustrated by where we are in government. I mean, we could see this is, we could see that this is a, a hot, hot mess. And those of us who have been advocating for cuts for years are just like, nobody's listening. Apparently we are in the super minority that everybody's just okay with it. Uh, take my dividend and use it to create this free government, uh, this, you know, this this big government teat that we all get to on. And so, I, I mean, I just, I'm a little frustrated. I'll be honest with you, a little frustrated about what's happening. It is frustrating. And and I'm going to be really interested in Ben Carpenter's reaction to all this. And I'll talk about why in the second segment. But But it's got to be frustrating for legislators who are truly trying to you know, get the ship turned around, get some get some incentives uh, to control government costs, get some structure in place that really sets us up for for a, a good future, a good fiscal future in this state. It's got to be really frustrating for them uh, because the governor really didn't give them anything um, in this veto message. Uh, the 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 cut in education spending, okay, but but he did nothing structurally to to make things easier for Ben Carpenter's committee or for others who are interested in, 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 in financial, fiscal responsibility to right. get their arms, to get their arms around the problem. So is, as frustrating as it is to you and me, I'm going to be interested oh. to see how frustrating yeah. it is to Ben. And, and well, others. especially since in his commentary, he still calls for this long-term fiscal plan. Yet at the same time, he submarines the people who are fighting hardest for the long-term fiscal plan. I mean, that just, that makes no sense. That's like, you know, slapping people around and saying, uh, you know, I really want what you got, but let me give you a smack to the face while you're here because it's not done. And you're, I mean, I, I do it's, not it, understand. It, it's just using words. It's using buzzwords, right? Yeah. I think we're supposed to have a responsible fiscal plan. Well, let me, let me put that in my, let me put that in my, in my announcement here. I'm not sure what it means. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not helping. I'm not trying to guide us toward it. You know, yeah. I just sort of sit back and wait for the legislature to do it. And then I just sort of react. But but here, th those are those are important words. Those are buzzwords. Let me, right. let me stick them in there. You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means uh, kind of thing. Right. I mean, that's that's where we're at. Um, just it's just astonishing. And the problem is, of course, the, the more this kind of stuff happens and the higher these things go, the, the entrepreneurs, the free market people are the ones that are eventually going to start, you know, leaving the state in droves. The, the people, the people who are, you know, corporate cronious, they're going to, they're going to lap it up like mother's milk. And the rest of the entrepreneurs are going to go, nope, bye. <laughs> and they're going to leave because they just can't compete. I mean, it's great that we don't have any taxes, but at the same time, it's going to be painful quickly. Well, the, the people who are going to stay are the people who can who who can figure out how to finagle getting government money uh, to support their business. Yeah. That's that's the kind of people we're going to have left. Yeah, we're creating a culture of cronyism, and it's just going to continue uh, as we move forward. Um, all right. Well, uh, final thoughts on this, and then give us a tease for number two today. Well, well I, 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 
I would encourage people to read the piece in the, in the landmine. I spent a lot of time on it, did a lot of calculations, run, ran it through several economists to make sure I wasn't, you know, going off on a frolic and detour here. And, and it's a, it's a solid piece of work that several people contributed to, 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 to make it, to bring it together. Um, and, and it really is, it's an eye opener about what's really going on. I mean, the PFD is a sideshow. The PFD is a sideshow to what's really going on with these mega dividends. All right. Uh, onto, onto the, onto the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, vetoes. I, the governor said something in his veto message in the, in the, in the brief paragraph that he put out, he said something that just astounds me. Um, and, and, and basically it is that, um, I'm fine with the, with the budget as, as I've made these adjustments, I'm fine with the budget. I think that's a horrible message. Um, and I'm going to talk about why in the second segment. We're on the weekly top three. Number two is, is the governor's vetoes. Um, and boy, I've got questions. Let's just put it that way. I've got questions, but Brad has got, he's got his little fixated here on one of the comments that the governor's made. So Brad, uh, <laughs> take, take her away, man. You are, you are good to go here. Here, here's the sentence that I just, I just stopped at. And I keep going back and reading and trying to understand, trying, trying to put a spin on it. That makes sense. Makes sense to me. The sentence it's in the third paragraph of what a four paragraph release by the governor um, uh, about the budget vetoes. The third paragraph begins this way: This budget, this budget, the budget he's just signed. This budget is a responsible path for Alaska's financial future. This budget is a responsible path for Alaska's financial future. This budget has a POMB 2575 dividend. Doesn't have anything approaching a statutory dividend. Doesn't even have anything approaching a POMB 5050 dividend. It has a POMB 2575 dividend. This budget has the second highest operating expenditure for operating uh, 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 expenditures, agency budget, the uh, agency budget, second highest this decade, you have to go back to Sean Parnell's last budget in 2013 to find a slightly higher one. This is up $400 million from the, the pre-oil boom, the pre-oil rush that we had the last couple of years. It's up $400 million, up 10%. The agency operations budget is up 10% from, from what we had in FY21 before we had those two years that were affected, affected by oil. This, this budget has no other revenues in it than PFD cuts. And yet, this governor says, this budget is a responsible path for Alaska's financial future. I, I'd be fine if he would have said, this budget's the best we can get with this, with this legislature. This right. budget's the best we can get You know, this time around. We're going to have to work hard. We're going to have to make it better. We're going to need to get the PFD up. We're going to need to talk about alternative substitute revenues. We're going to need to talk about additional cuts because this one increases operate the, the agency budget by 10%. We're going to have to, but he doesn't say any of that. Right. It's an what implicit, it's an implicit endorsement of the 2575 model. Well, it's an implicit endorsement of jumping operating, of jumping the operating budget by 10% over three years. I, I, I get all that stuff. I get all that stuff they got in there about, oh, it's lower than inflation. Well, it's lower than inflation because you cut the capital budget and you cut statewide spending. Statewide spending's down because we're not having to re we're not we're not having to reimburse oil tax credits any longer to the same extent. You it's 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 down on it's down on 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 inflation because of those. But in terms of the of the agency budget, it's up by ten percent from FY from FY twenty one. I. I for someone to say this budget is a responsible path for Alaska's financial future, I don't know what he's. I don't get it. I don't, I don't get what he's. I don't. I, I don't get what he's saying. Anyway, two uh, two other things about it. One, there's no discussion of the PFD. There's no discussion of sales taxes. Remember, the governor came out with this press conference. Right. Last press conference he had said right. we're going to talk about sales taxes because we need alternative revenues. No discussion of sales taxes, and not only no discussion of a special session. Although, although 
Rob Myers would probably say a special <laughs> session sort of worthless. Not right. only no discussion of a special session, he vetoed. One of the vetoes is the money that got put in to cover the cost of the special session. And the explanation of the veto is unnecessary. <laughs> wow. So, so what, what, you know, what messages is he sending out there? He's saying, I think this is a responsible path for Alaska's fin financial future at a POMV 2575 and a 10% jump in the, in the agency budget. I think it's fine not to talk about the PFD. I think it's fine not to talk about sales taxes. And I think it's fine. Just forget about the, the special session. I, I, Bill Walker couldn't have done as bad as, as, as what's going on here with that sentence and, and these, and these non sentences, nothing about the PFD, nothing about sales taxes, nothing about the special session. I mean, we're sort of left, we're sort of left in the same place that Bill Walker left us, which is, PFD cuts, bam. Legislature did them, bam. Hey, you guys who voted against the budget, I'm going to well, punish you. Yeah, that's the big question. I mean, I mean, even the ADN was kind of scratching their head like, wait, he he vetoed all the road projects for the people who voted against the budget, who are his supposed allies in this fight for a 50-50 PFD, et cetera, and no commentary on why that happened. Yeah, it's um, I don't know, Michael. It's just uh, the the the, you know, we're at a five point one. This leaves us at a five point one billion dollar budget. The um, the 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 FY twenty one budget was four point six billion total. This is this is agency statewide and capital. The FY twenty one budget before the two years that got hit by oil was 4.6. The one between before that was 4.8. Uh, the last one in the Walker administration was 4.8. This one's 5.1. It only looks good by comparison to where the legislature left it, right? The legislature left the budget at 5.3 UGF, a agency plus statewide plus capital. Dunleavy cuts 200 million from that, 5.1, declares victory, but that victory is much higher uh, than than where the the budget was uh, before we hit the before we hit the oil rush. So, I is sending all sorts of, of wrong messages. Hopefully, the governor corrects some of those or right. elaborates on some of those and sort of you know redirects. But it's not you know to say this is a responsible path for Alaska's financial future. Is is a statement that Bill Walker would agree with. I mean, this is a budget. This is a budget that Bill Walker would. Agree it reminds with. me of the classic tactic of "Look at me, I've cut the budget." No, what you've done is you've cut the increase to the budget. You haven't really cut the budget. You've cut the increase. The where we end up at the end is further is larger than what we had to begin with. That's not a cut. You know, oh, they wanted to increase at fifty percent. You cut twenty five percent. We're still at a twenty five percent increase. I mean, that's. But this is a classic tactic. Look at what I did. Here's where we are. I mean, it's, it's insane. Yeah. And he's going to, and he's, he's getting pushback obviously about the, 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 the cut to the, to the, to the, to education spending. And he's going to say, and he's going to say, look, I'm a conservative. I cut, I cut education spending, the increase in education spending in half. Well, yeah, but look at the rest of what you did and look at what you just said about what you did, about what you left behind. And it's a mess. So yeah. I, I, um, we got a long way to go. I mean, yeah. and, 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 and we got a long way to go without, without a roadmap on where we're going, uh, in terms of getting, in terms of getting things, uh, getting things fixed going forward. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets, the weekly top three, Brad on to number three, which is the hypocrisy. Uh, been a lot of discussion about on the national level, the hypocrisy of the Republicans. Uh, we're for smaller, more limited government. But look at all the lucre that we can fling around here at the national level. Uh, and you said, well, true. But look at what's going on in the Alaska legislature as well. Hit us with it. Well, there's two there's two op eds that, that, that grabbed my attention. One was in the ADN uh, by Don Mitchell. And the title of it is Sullivan's hypocrisy, Senator Dan Sullivan's hypocrisy on U.S. spending. And basically what he's saying is, you know, Sullivan says, we got to cut spending, we got to cut spending, we got to cut spending. 
but then he's one of the biggest proponents of increasing de defense spending, which means the spending you got to cut is like Medicaid, Medicare, and and Social Security, and and you know other things that that help out people. So it uh, uh, Mitchell's pointing out uh, Solomon's hypocrisy. There's another one in the Juno Empire that has basically the same uh, headline: Solomon's complaints about debt ceiling deal reveal hypocrisy about government spending. All that's true. Dan Sullivan is being hypocritical about, about government spending. He is talking out of both sides of his mouth about, about federal spending. But here's the deal. The Democrats in Alaska are doing exactly the same thing. The Democrats are in Alaska are saying, look, I'm for the working Alaska family. I came down here to protect working Alaska families. I'm, I'm here to make sure that working Alaska families are prioritized and that we look out for them because the top 20% can look out for themselves, basically, is what the message is. Yet, the Democrats, the House minority, was the balance of power that resulted, that, that voted with the, with the top 20% Senate that resulted in a POMB 2575, took money out of the pockets of working Alaska families so that the top 20% could have more and more money to protect them from paying taxes. They could have higher and higher tax avoidance dividends. The hypocrisy that we're seeing at the federal level is true and we need to call it out. And I don't disagree at all with either one of these, either one of these op-eds about, about the position that Sullivan's been taking. But the exactly the same thing with the same effect, with the same level is going on at the state level. And if we're gonna call out Republicans at the federal level for engaging in this sort of hypocrisy, we need to be calling out Democrats, particularly the House minority in Alaska for the same sort of hypocrisy. You're not protecting working Alaska families. You're protecting the top 20% from having to pay for government. All you're doing is protecting government spending by making sure the top 20% don't have any stake in the game. They don't have to pay for it, so they don't care. And that's that's a that's a hypocrisy at the state level that that is equally as bad as the hypocrisy that we've got going on. If you really cared about Alaskan families, you'd fight for that full statutory PFD. That's yep. what you fight for. I mean, Brad, that's really the bottom line. If you cared about Alaskan families, if, if you had a wit of economic know-how in your brain at all, you would know that that money would do more for Alaskan families in the short term and in the long term. It would do more for the Alaska economy, which was a rising tide floats all boats. The economy would go up by putting that money back into the economy instead of retaining it for government, just on the bare idea that the money turns so many more times in private hands than it does in public hands, et cetera, et cetera. But that's what astonishes me. These Democrats keep going back again and again and again, and they're not fighting for a full PFD. They're not fighting for those people. They're not really looking out for the people they're looking out for the public spend because that's where their money comes in that's where their support comes from is the employees state employees unions and all these special interest groups that all want the government lucre so whatever it takes to make sure that that bill gets paid that's what they're about exactly and 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 it's it's a little bit more than that michael i think especially with zach fields i mean i spent a lot of time watching what zach fields writes and what he says with with zach it's more than that what zach's really doing is he saying, I want to spend a lot of money on my constituency, my union constituency. I want a lot of government employees. I want a lot of government, I want a lot of government spending. But I don't want anybody to complain about. I don't want anybody that gives me money or supports me to complain about it. So what I'm going to do is take the money out of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. And heck, you know, maybe some of them will agree to that. Maybe they'll think it's free money. So yeah, maybe they maybe they maybe they think it's okay to cut it. And I'm going to make sure it's the top 20%, my top 20% donors, and my top 20% union members who otherwise might object don't have to pay for it, that, that we can take it all out of middle and lower income Alaska families. So it's more than simply not looking out for middle and lower income Alaska families. It is, it is affirmatively going after middle and lower income Alaska families by using the fiscal method that takes money out of their pocket and protects the top 20% donors and the top 20% union members. And <clears throat> this, of course, is a continuous problem. This is, I mean, we can go look back and see for 30 years, 40 years, this has been what's going on. And I, this is exactly the same thing that I've been decrying for the last almost 10 years. You've been decrying with me on the show. 
Uh, and we've moved off of the cuts only approach to at least offering other alternatives. And yet the answer is continuously to pull the one lever that that impacts and hurts the Alaskan families and the Alaskan economies more than anything else. And, and you don't have to be an economic genius to figure that out. All you have to do is read the, the 2016 ICER study that tells you exactly that. It's it's not it, it, they can't even complain that oh I don't know I don't you know maybe some people say that no there's a study that tells you exactly what the impacts are the economic impacts are of the course you're on and that study says that cutting the PFD of all the options all the revenue options cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and the largest adverse impact on 80% of Alaska families period it says it right there, black and white. All you have right. to do is read it. And so for for them to for, for for them to say, oh well, you know, we're really looking out for no, you're, we're really looking out for for you know families in need. No, you're not. You're looking out. You're looking out for your constituencies, and you're looking out for people that are segments that 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 got you elected or are important to you. But you're not looking out for middle and lower income Alaska families, even if even if you accept for a moment. That you're looking out for those in need in the in the bottom 20 percent that all of the social programs are needed to help those in the bottom 20 percent you're still leaving high and dry the 60 percent in the middle who pay more through pfd cuts and suffer more through pfd cuts than they would through through alternative revenue measures so it's I, it, it is it it is hypocrisy and it's 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 a little bit worse than that with some of them it's an affirmative, um, uh, uh, whatever the word is. It, it's a, an affirmative attack on middle and middle and lower income Alaska families by taking money out of their pockets so the top twenty percent don't have to pay, so they won't have pushback from the top twenty percent from the donor class from their donors uh, as they as they you know continue to shuffle money around to support government all while patting themselves on the back and telling everybody what a good job they're doing uh, at the same time and giving themselves a 67% pay raise. Let's not forget that. I mean, you know what that does? That moves every, all of them, all the legislators into the top 20%. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. Um, well, I mean, uh, like I said, Brad, I just, I don't even know. I don't even know what to make of it anymore. Just to watch this kind of thing go along. I had hopes that the governor would make some meaningful cuts. He did make some cuts, but at the same time, implicitly endorsing the 2575 rule and not even talking about the dividend and then cutting the projects in the districts of the people who voted against the budget. I, I and, then, and then cutting the budget for the special session. <laughs> yeah, and then cutting the budget out for the special session. I don't even know. I mean, what do you say to that? And then won't come on and discuss or talk about or give reasoning behind what he's doing or why. It's well, it's well, astonishing. My, my conclusion is it's a budget that Bill Walker would be proud of. And Mike, Mike Dunleavy just said it's a responsible path for Alaska's financial future. Yeah, I wish I had a V8. What? Uh, <laughs> that's weird. Uh, final thoughts here, Brad, as we wrap things up. Well, we'll see this coming week. Uh, what the reaction to this is? There's going to be a lot of pushback from those who are upset about the about the cut in education spending. Uh, uh, we'll see what the reaction. I'm going to be looking for the reaction by the Rob Myers, by the Ben Carpenters, the, those who have been working toward trying to get a fiscal fix. Maybe they see something in this veto message that I'm not. Maybe they see a path forward in how Humpty Dumpty gets put back together again. But it's certainly not clear to me. Uh, uh, what the path forward is. So I'm going to be very interested in what their in what their reactions are. All right. Well, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board. As always, good to Michael, talk. As to always, you. Thank, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keith Light, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.